Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending cybersecurity in an, an increasingly scary world. This is Lisa Cummings from Interdine Artists, and I have Ashley Canali with us from Interdine. She's also another one of our client strategy managers. And we also have Chris Dobkins from Ingevity with us today, who is going to be our presenter. If you will hold your questions till the end of the presentation, then we can address them. That will allow us the time to get through all of the presentation, and then we um, can address each of the questions at the end of that. Uh, we also will be recording this, and you will get a copy of it so that if you need to um, go back to it and refresh your memory on what we've discussed today, then you'll have a copy of that as well. So Chris, if you'd like to go ahead. Oh, one last thing. Um, we would like to remind everybody about GPUG Summit 2018. If you're planning on going um, and you have not registered yet, go ahead and do so by September the 6th because you can still save a $200 um, amount on your registration, which is pretty significant. And that is in October from the 15th through the 18th. So we hope to see everybody there. So Chris, if you want to go ahead and take it away, um, I'm going to hand it over to you at this time. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Chris Dobkins, and I am the president of Ingevity. Uh, we are a cloud provider for Dynamics GP that uh, has two cloud brands. We have our Ingevity to Go brand, which is a Dynamics GP hosted in the cloud solution. And we have our Power GP Online brand, which is a public cloud solution for Dynamics GP running in the Azure cloud. Uh, and our focus is on delivering exceptional cloud experiences for Dynamics GP, CRM, Power BI, and Office 365. Uh, we uh, we have a little over 3,000 users that depend on us every day to manage the security of their Dynamics data, their mission critical Dynamics data in the cloud. And so we've put this cybersecurity session together uh, to help our customers understand some of the threats that are out there with uh, with security and uh, so if you're an on-prem GP customer you know some of the things you need to be concerned about uh, many of the things we'll be talking about today are advantages of being in the cloud with Dynamics GP so if you are working with artists on cloud solutions for your GP system many of these things will be uh, will already be addressed by your cloud provider one of the great benefits of being in the cloud is you don't have to worry so much about some of this complicated security stuff uh, our mission at Ingevity is to improve the life and success of our partners and customers by providing exceptional business application experiences that simplify, inform, and delight. Uh, simplification is a big cornerstone for us across all of our cloud solutions and yet really helping our customers simplify their own lives through not having to worry about some of these cybersecurity threats is really the, the, the topic that we want to, we want to be covering today. The agenda, we're going to talk about some of the threats that are out there, some of the bad actors and, and uh, threats that have made the news recently. Then we're going to talk about some of the things you can do to secure your data, your systems uh, from, uh, from being susceptible to attack. And then finally, we're going to focus on training your team. Now, this is the area where whether you're in the cloud or on-prem, uh, training your team on things like password policies and how to identify phishing attacks is is really critical. Whether whether your uh, data is in the cloud or not, uh, uh, this element of cybersecurity, the personal element, is just really really important, and uh, will have an impact to you uh, really across the board. So let's start by talking about some of the uh, the threats that are out there. Uh, if you're a small business and you are trying to uh, manage the security of your applications, uh, you know some of these stories that you hear in the news uh, probably keep you up a little bit at night, right? Uh, yeah, you know, the Under Armour breach that happened earlier this year that affected 150 million users of My Fitness Pro uh, was a huge story. 
the Yahoo breach that affected 3 billion users. Uh, and then just recently, uh, we had uh, a breach of the Ticketmaster website where uh, some bad actors were, uh, were, were pulling credit card data that, that customers were entering right off the, uh, right off the site and, uh, and uh, selling that information. So, you know, it seems like every time you, you turn on the TV, uh, you know, we're hearing some story of some massive data breach. Uh, and these are big companies. You know, these are companies that have cybersecurity teams in place. These are companies that are working on trying to make sure that their their data is secure. Uh, so, as a small business, you may be thinking, "Gosh, uh, if Ticketmaster can get uh, can get hacked, if Panera Bread, uh, then you know, what does that mean for me and and for my business? And and how safe are we really? How safe is our customers' data really? Uh, and uh, you know, starting to try to understand what some of these threats are and how you can protect yourself against those is a is a big part of starting to address this problem. But not only have we had a lot of uh, news of data breaches, uh, last year the WannaCry virus was, uh, was a huge story. Many of you may remember that. That's a, a ransomware attack that, uh, where in which some malicious code would get onto your computer and then it would encrypt your personal data, your, your pictures of your family or your business databases with all your business data in it. And uh, then they would, they would demand a ransom payment in order to unencrypt that data so you could get it back. Uh, you know, these are, uh, you know, th these are attacks that have a lot of different attack vectors. And as a small business, uh, you know, you really have to be aware of, of, of what these kind of attacks are and how they get in. Uh, most of these ransomware attacks come through phishing attacks. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about what phishing is uh, a little later in this session. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can train your employees to identify phishing emails uh, so they never click on the link that installs the WannaCry virus. So we're going to be talking about that here shortly. Uh, earlier this year, we also had uh, some news about some some vulnerabilities that are in the processors of every computer device that's been manufactured since like 1984. Uh, you know, this is a pretty significant uh, revelation that uh, uh, all of these processors have these vulnerabilities that uh, through the first quarter of this year had all of us in the cloud and data center businesses really scrambling, trying to figure out uh, how do we how do we protect against these these new threats? Uh, so, you know, we have uh, you know between hackers and and uh, uh, data breaches and and ransomware, you know, there's just a lot that you as a as a small business person need to be thinking about as you start putting your data out on the internet. Uh, we've also got. Uh, state-sponsored hacking. Uh, just recently, there was a massive hack undertaken by the, uh, uh, the state of Iran uh, that was sponsoring uh, some, uh, some hackers to, um, uh, to uh, attack universities, and they stole about $3.4 billion in intellectual property from 144 different US-based universities. Uh, you know, so, you know, you're not just dealing with, uh, you know, some, you know, uh, pimply guy sitting in his mom's basement trying to uh, hack into, uh, you know, NORAD Mountain and start war games. You know, these are, uh, these are hackers that have significant technology and funding behind them uh, to really go after some of the most secure networks out there. So, you know, as we, as we have, these state-sponsored uh, hacking attempts and hacking groups. We have all these new viruses and, and malware and ransomware out there, uh, dramatic increases in phishing attacks. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, we get, uh, I get in my personal inbox probably at least a dozen phishing attacks a week, sometimes more. I mean, they are uh, just increasing at a very rapid pace, uh, these attacks, which you know, you really only need one weak link in your company to click on that uh, that link in the email, and now you know you may have a problem within your organization. Uh, so, 
you know, what we find is that staying protected, protecting and inoculating your organization from these cyber threats has just gotten much, much more complicated uh, over the last seven, several years. So what are some things that you can do about this? Uh, the first is is uh, is kind of security 101, but it seems to be one of those things that we uh, uh, we sort of put at the bottom of the priority list, and that's just uh, making sure that the physical security of our building and our computer systems are protected. Uh, whether that is uh, you know having somebody at the front door of your office, a receptionist or somebody that. Uh, you know, interviews people briefly before they just walk into the office, uh, or whether that's just having a policy within your organization that, you know, if you see somebody walking around the hallway that you don't recognize, stop and have a conversation with them, you know, make sure they actually belong there. Uh, and when you walk away from your computers, lock them. Uh, you know, and I don't mean you know using a physical lock, but uh, using you know your your Windows system to just lock the computer. So if somebody wanted to gain access to some data on your computer, they'd have to know your credentials to be able to get to your desktop. Uh, you know, these are some simple things that you can do. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to protect ourselves from the invisible hacker, uh, but then we'll leave ourselves open to someone just walking into our office. Uh, picking the server up out of our, you know, the broom closet in our kitchen and walking home with it, uh, or uh, walking into the office and taking someone's laptop off their desk, or even more benign than that, just walking in and sitting down at somebody's desk and starting to read through some of their emails or, you know, looking through the files that are stored on their computer. Um, making sure that you have physical security in your building so that uh, you don't have theft, physical theft of data that can then turn into a data breach uh, or just unauthorized access of your employees' computers uh, is, uh, is really important. But often this is the first thing or the last thing that we think to do. We're so focused on the electronic aspects of it. Now, the next thing you need to do after you secure your physical uh, area is to secure your network. Uh, within our networks, the firewall is really the core of our cybersecurity system. This is the thing that sits between all the devices on your business network and the internet. Uh, this is the device that a lot that determines what what kind of traffic is allowed to come into your network and what isn't. Uh, many firewalls today even have antivirus and anti-malware and intrusion protection software built into them uh, to give you even more protection on your electronic perimeter. Uh, but this is really you know, the main element of, of what you need to keep your network safe. Now, if you're, if you're wondering, gosh, do I have a firewall in my business? Um, if your cable modem is your firewall, you don't have a firewall. Uh, if you're, uh, if the little box that uh, the phone company gave you, or uh, you know whoever it is that you buy from, buy your internet from, the little box they put into your networking closet, um, you know that little box is is not a firewall. It might be a wireless router. It might be just simply your internet modem that's allowing the internet traffic into your office. But either way, these devices are not designed to prevent bad actors from gaining access to your network, especially sophisticated ones. So if you go look in your, in your uh, network closet uh, and you don't, you don't have anything beside that cable modem in there, uh, you should you should talk to your team at Artis, get in touch with some IT professionals who can help you make sure that you have the right kind of equipment to sufficiently protect your network. If you have internet facing servers in your environment, uh, whether these are, are servers that employees use for remote access or uh, their web servers, uh, you wanna make sure that those servers are in a DMZ. This is a special area of your firewalled network that allows certain devices to be securely internet facing, but uh, doesn't allow uh, access to say your database servers or, or other servers that have your, um, your, your, your files on them. Uh, so make sure that you've, you've segregated your network into 
a super private area and then a somewhat private area. That's what the, the DMZ is. Uh, next, uh, uh, make sure that you work with a professional to configure the firewall. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of us as small businesses, we have you know a computer guy in the office whose real job is sales and marketing, or uh, you know maybe it's maybe it's your controller that's also kind of your IT person. Um, configuring a firewall to adequately protect your organization is typically a skill set that goes beyond what the person who does your general computer support in your office would would really adequately be able to do. Uh, so do them a favor, do yourselves a favor, uh, hire somebody that does firewalls and network security for a living to configure that firewall for you. Uh, that will help you make sure that uh, you've, you've been set up to be secure from the beginning. Uh, but next, consider hiring the person that installed your firewall to manage it for you. Uh, firewalls are uh, like computers that run software. Uh, they may not run Windows software, but they run software that uh, that does all the work on that firewall device. And that software needs to be updated regularly. It needs to be patched. Uh, they'll have new uh, new threat profile files that need to get downloaded into it on a regular basis. So the the firewall is not a set it and forget it thing. Uh, you you not only want somebody who knows what they're doing to set it up but you need somebody to come in and check on it once a month, once a quarter, just to make sure that you're staying up to date and that the system is functioning the way you expect and keeping you secure the way that you expect it to. So once you've secured your perimeter and you've secured your network, the next thing you want to do is secure your data. Now there are two types of data encryption that we talk about that help protect your data within your organization. Uh, the first is something we call in-motion encryption. This is the, the encryption technology that encrypts your data as it travels over the wire. Uh, if you are shopping on Amazon.com and you type in your credit card number, you, know, you don't want that credit card number to travel over the public internet and be visible by anybody who happens to be watching. Uh, in-motion encryption we hear this uh, oftentimes as SSL, secure socket layer encryption. Uh, these are the certificates that encrypt the data as it's traveling over the internet so that uh, somebody who just happens to be watching that wire can't see the data in plain text form move across the wire. The second type of encryption that we have is called at rest encryption. This is the kind of encryption that, that protects data that's sitting on a disk drive. Uh, this, you know, imagine a scenario where uh, maybe you're commuting to work, you're on a train, and you've got your laptop bag with you. And while you're on that train, maybe you forget your laptop bag and you leave it behind, or maybe somebody steals your laptop from you while you're on that train. Uh, if your data on that disk, is, on the, the disks in your laptop is not encrypted, uh, the, whoever stole your laptop will be able to gain access to it. Now you may say, well, come on, I've got, I've got username and password on my computer, so no one's gonna be able to break into my computer. And you may be absolutely right. If they try to turn your computer on, uh, they'll get prompted for usernames and passwords and they can't get past that. But they can very easily pop the disk drive out of your laptop, put it in a USB enclosure and plug that into any other computer. And if your data on that drive is not encrypted, they'll have access to everything that was on the hard drive in your laptop. So uh, it's very important that if you have a lot of laptops in your business, make sure you're encrypting those drives because those, those laptops are very easily uh, stolen or, or lost or misplaced. Now, fortunately, uh, both Windows and Apple have free disk encryption technology built into their computers. With Microsoft uh, in Windows, they call it BitLocker, and Apple calls it FileVault. Uh, these are free technologies that are built into your Windows and Apple computers that will encrypt your disk drives so that if somebody did steal your laptop, when they try to look at your drive, they won't be able to see any data on it. All the data will be uh, stored in an encrypted state. Now, what's really important here is uh, if you do decide to turn this uh, this technology on, uh, 
keep your encryption keys. Uh, because if you uh, ever need to reinstall Windows or you actually want to move that drive to another laptop, uh, if that data is encrypted and you don't have your encryption keys, you'll lose it all. Uh, so uh, make sure you keep those, uh, those keys. Uh, the final topic that I want to talk about today is training your team. Uh, and I want to start with training your team on password management. I, I don't know if, if any of you have ever watched uh, the show Mr. Robot on TV. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, favorite shows about uh, cybersecurity uh, and some real world hacking attempts. The, uh, uh, the point they always come back to in that show is that the weakest link in any security system are the human beings that interact with that security system. So if somebody can walk into your office, for example, and your computer is locked, but your password is on a sticky note on your monitor, not super secure, right? You know, we, we have uh, over the years come up with more complex password uh, mechanisms. So a lot of us just can't remember our passwords. So we're writing them down somewhere. Uh, and that can be a real, uh, a real breach point for your systems. Uh, so instead of writing your passwords down, uh, there's some great password managers out there like 1Password and LastPass uh, that will store all your passwords for all the websites that you go to and it will uh, even automatically fill those passwords in for you so you never actually even have to type them. Uh, it can be a really good way to, to manage different passwords for, for all the different sites that you visit and you know, prevent you from having everything written down somewhere. Uh, and then again, you know, make sure you lock your computer when you walk away from it. The best password policy in the world uh, only works if people actually have to use your password to gain access to your computer. Uh, now, on top of that, uh, you know, many of you probably have password policies in force in your organizations. You may even be a little frustrated that you have to change your passwords every 30 days or so, and they have to have all these special characters in them that are hard to remember. Uh, for you, we've got some really great news. Um, just just uh, in the last several months, uh, NIST, the National Institute for Science and Technology, has released a whole new set of recommendations for corporate password policy. And one of the one of the biggest recommendations they've made is this whole passwords expiring every thirty or sixty days or so. Uh, that that just ought to stop. Uh, what they've discovered is uh, that uh, we don't really change our passwords every 30 days. Uh, what we do is we just increment the number at the end of our password, right? So like maybe your password is your child's name, you know, uh, Julia01. And every time you're forced to change the password, you just make it Julia02 or Julia03. Uh, or uh, you're, you're forced to make it something completely different, so you write it down on a sticky note and put it on your monitor so you can remember it. Uh, so what, what NIST has found through their research is that this constant changing of passwords uh, actually does not improve the security of our password policy. Uh, so they're saying, listen, let people keep their passwords uh, and only feel like you need to change them if there's been a breach. Uh, what they've also said, NIST has said, is that some of these complex passwords that we use, where you have to have you know, uppercase and lowercase letters and numbers and special characters, uh, you know, this was a really good idea until we all got trained on how to do it, right? And we all know that you replace E's with threes and you replace S's with fives and I's become ones or exclamation points. Uh, you know, we all decided to use the exact same uh, replacement model to replace our characters with special characters. And what NIST has found is that, that, that the hackers know that we do that and they've modified their their password hacking algorithms to take those special characters into an account. Uh, so the, the complex password thing is actually not nearly as helpful to us as we think it is. Uh, what NIST has said is that really uh, a simple, long, memorable passphrase is really much better than uh, how we've been doing passwords. Uh, they're actually now starting to recommend that instead of eight character passwords, that we use 12 to 24 character passphrases, uh, but that those 
longer passphrases don't need all those upper lower uh, numbers and special characters in them. Just simply making the password longer makes it significantly more complicated to crack. So for example, the passphrase correct horse battery staple is a much, much more secure password than Troubadour with uh, you know, the O replaced with a zero and, <laughs> and so forth, as you see there. Uh, they also suggest as you're doing this, uh, if you're going to use a passphrase, you wanna use a series of four random words. Uh, don't use a popular phrase like four score and seven years ago or uh, you know, a quote from a movie, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, you don't want to use any of those kind of uh, trite populist phrases because you know, the hackers can program those into their uh, algorithms pretty easily as well. So instead, coming up with, with a series of words that are memorable and meaningful to you, um, but you know, also don't play Kaiser Soze around your office and uh, come up with you know, clock picture, coat rack, chair, um, you know, because anybody sitting in your office might be able to put those words together. So some things to think about as you consider your password policies and uh, maybe a little uh, ray of hope for those of you listening that are frustrated with the password policies put in place by your company. So finally, uh, I want to close by talking about phishing. Uh, phishing attacks are, are the most successful attack vector for a bad actor to gain access to your data. Uh, just recently in the news, we've, we've been hearing that uh, you know, some of these state-sponsored uh, hackers around uh, the American election, you know, the way they got into to some of the email uh, servers was through phishing attacks. Uh, a phishing attack is uh, when someone sends you an email that appears to be from someone you know or a company that you trust. Uh, within that email, there'll be a request to click on a link or open a file, uh, and it's gonna look very benign, but that file, that link, is actually going to install malicious code on your device. That malicious code might open a back door for a bad actor to break in, or it could in implement a ransomware attack that uh, locks down your uh, your family photos or your personal data, uh, or it could just be something that uh, has a key, lo key logger on it that uh, is designed to try to steal your passwords to the websites that you visit. Uh, but once that malicious code gets installed, uh, it's there and it may, may or may not be detected by your anti-malware, anti-virus software. It depends uh, you know, what kind of attack it is and how up-to-date your antivirus, anti-malware is. So how do you identify a phishing attack? Uh, when I get an email from UPS that says, click here to check on the status of your package, you know, how do I know if this is a legitimate email or not? Um, first, uh, you can look at the actual email address. I'm gonna show you some screenshots of how you do this. So it's very easy to mask a display name for an email to make it look like this email came from UPS or Federal Express. It's, uh, it's impossible to completely hide the email address that you're gonna reply to or that the, the, uh, the item is from. You can also, if you have a link in the doc in your email, you can hover over that link, whether it's a click here phrase or a button, and the actual URL will pop up in a pop-up menu so you can see what it is uh, and make sure that it's legitimate. Uh, and then finally, you, know, you, you wanna train your team to use critical thinking. Uh, did this email come from someone who normally sends me project updates? Uh, yeah, we've we've received some of these before where we'll get a, a critical project update email notification, but the, but it comes from a vendor, somebody that we never do projects with. And uh, so we just have to you know, stop and think before you click on it. This seems a little unusual. Is it is it really legit? Uh, we've even had some scenarios where bad actors have hacked someone's email. And when we've replied and said, hey, Joe, I think you've been hacked. This doesn't look like it's really from you. Uh, the hacker will reply, pretending to be Joe, and say, no, 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 it's totally fine. Go ahead and click on the link. Uh, so, you know, really make sure you have your critical thinking caps on as, uh, uh, as you're working uh, at these emails. So an example, uh, this, these are some real world examples that I pulled out of my inbox. 
Uh, the first, uh, this is an email that comes from the Office 365 team. It says, my password is about to expire. Uh, when I open the email, you can see the long uh, actual email address, mail underscore new dash delivered dash team, et cetera. Uh, the part that comes after the at sign, amita.mitwald.de, that's where the email is actually going. Uh, so just by looking at that, I can tell this isn't really the Office 365 team. Now, if I don't, if I don't look at that, uh, down at the bottom of the email, I have a link that says it's going to take me to microsoftonline.com. Uh, but if I hover my mouse over that link without clicking on it, just hover your mouse over it, uh, that black text at the end of the arrow where this link really goes, that's what shows up. And again, we can see that this isn't going anywhere uh, close to a Microsoft Online URL. Another example of this, uh, I get this message a lot. Uh, some of your messages were not successfully sent. Oh no, I need to go fix that. And it says, click here to resend the emails. Again, just like before, when I look at the domain that the email is coming from and I hover over the click here link, I can see that this is this is not a legitimate message at all. Uh, and then finally, this is another one I get a lot, uh, either from FedEx or from UPS, telling me I have a, a parcel on hold. Uh, click here to submit your correct delivery address, right? I mean, all this stuff looks super legit until you dig into it a little bit more. And you know, if I'm if I'm responding to these messages from my mobile phone, uh, from my iPad, you know, I may not look closely enough uh, to see this, or maybe I'm just I've got my, uh, my Outlook reading pane on and I'm just clicking through emails real quickly. Uh, you know, it's really easy for somebody who hasn't been trained in identifying uh, malicious emails uh, to click on something. And again, uh, these bad actors, they only need one person in your organization. They're, they're trying to exploit the weakest link. You know, they know that your VP of, of information technology security is probably not going to fall prey to the phishing attack. Uh, but they only need, you know, one admin, one receptionist, uh, one person who works in the shipping department or uh, in, the, uh, in the delivery room. And they only need one person in your organization to click this link and they could have access to your company's uh, private data. Uh, so it's really important that you train all of the employees, anybody that has access to your network environment on how to identify these kind of attacks. Uh, because we are really seeing a, a marked increase in the number of these kind of attacks that, uh, uh, that are out there. If you find a phishing attack, you can report it. Uh, there is an email address spam at uce.gov. Uh, the FTC also has a place where you can file a complaint uh, or you could you could send it to uh, APWG.org. Uh, so any of these uh, addresses uh, you can use to report. You could also uh, you call your local police department uh, or the local uh, office of your FBI. So that uh, that brings me to the end of the content and I'd love to open it up for questions if uh, if anybody has them. Thanks, Chris. Um, just one question, I think. Um, when we're talking those phishing emails, um, there is it possible to just open an email and get this virus, or is it only when you click the actual link that it's getting onto your server? Uh, it should require you to actually click a link or to open mm -hmm. a file. Uh, so just the act of opening the email itself should not infect mm -hmm. your device. Um, but you know, sometimes there'll be a zip file or a Word document or an Excel file. Uh, and you know, just because the file has a .pdf extension on it doesn't necessarily mean it's really a PDF. Uh, so you know, opening a file that's attached or clicking a link, either one of those things could be the, the thing that installs the malicious code. Got it. Perfect. Um, that was the only question that we had today. If you guys have anything or you think about something later, feel free to reach out to Lisa and I. This is Ashley um, over here at Interdine if you need anything, if you have any questions. 
Yeah, thank you all for attending today. And again, we will have the recording for you um, once we um, get it all prepared and we'll send it out. And it will also be on our website. Thank you, Chris, for your time today. Sure, happy to do it. And uh, if uh, uh, any of you listening do have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the Interdyne Artist team and they can certainly get you in touch with our team of cybersecurity experts to help you uh, sort out your, your concerns.